Hi, everybody. This is John Bell, and I'm your host with DogmanCams.com. And today we've got a very exciting show for you. We're doing a roundtable panel discussion about the credibility of Victor. Victor as a witness from Jeff Nataloni's show, uh, Dogman Encounters, which I love his show. He's a buddy of mine, and I suggest if anyone hasn't checked out his channel, please go to uh, Dogman Encounters with Jeff Nataloni and and listen to his stuff, especially if you're not familiar with, with what we're talking about tonight. But most people should be fairly uh, familiar in this channel with uh, with Victor, the source that uh, that claims he's from the CIA and a CIA insider from Jeff Nataloni's show. So that's the discussion tonight. We're going to be talking about pros and cons as to whether this is a credible source or not. And the reason, one of the reasons I want to do this, cover this topic, is because of the fact that there's some uh, friends of mine that are in the game and have their own shows and things like that who don't think he's a very credible source for one reason or another, and uh, they have the right to their opinion. But today we've got some uh, we've got some gentlemen with us on our panel that are researchers and. And they've been able to uh, to investigate this farther than most other people that I know on the subject. So when it comes to taking someone's opinion versus somebody else's actual research, I'm swaying towards the research. And that's what we're going to be discussing tonight. So let's get it started. I'm going to introduce our first panel guest, and his name is Hunter. So uh, Hunter, why don't you introduce yourself, give us a bio, and how you got into this this field. Uh, thanks, John. Um, hey, and uh, welcome, TJ, my two Dogman battle buddies. So uh, um, I think I was always interested in, um, I'm more interested in the things we don't know versus the things we do know. Um, you know, historically, I think I've always gravitated towards those things. And I think my earliest encounter was probably in the late 60s, growing up on a dairy farm in Illinois, and my dad had an encounter with something. To this day, we don't know what it was, and he never saw it except that it made a god awful noise uh, going up and down the cornfield and scaring our cattle to death. And, you know, he'd always have to round up the cows and bring them into the, the milking barn to milk them. On those days that this creature was around, they almost broke the door down to get inside. So, um, I would have been like five years old at the time. And my dad's told me the story a few times and they always thought it was a big cat or something. But, um, you know, knowing what I know now about um, some of the other cryptids, I don't think it was a big cat. I actually believe, and I have no proof of this, um, it was probably a dog man or such. Um, but I mean, hey, we're speculating. It's, you know, 50 years later, but anyway, so, um, yeah, I grew up in the country, always hunting and fishing and spent more time in the woods probably than, than in school, unfortunately. Uh, but I did graduate, so that's a good thing. And I went on and served in the military for a long, long, long time and um, just retired. And um, I got uh, six years of combat in Afghanistan, Iraq. And so, uh, and I spent, you know, most of my time in my latter years was, was in logistics. However, before that, it was um, infantry and some time in SF. And as a civilian, I worked in the Intel community for a while. And that's where I re first reached out to TJ. So he gets, he gets, after listening to Jeff's channel, he gets an email from an Intel guy. Of course, he'd been listening to Victor, too. And he's like, oh, shit. Now, who's this guy? Because um, I, I found him quite easily and, and sent him an email through from my uh, Intel email. So, but anyway, um, I'd had interest in um, uh, cryptids. I mean, I remember buying a Bigfoot book when I was 17 years old and, um, you know, reading that. And I was pretty fascinated with that stuff way back in the day. And I didn't spend a lot of time with that over the years just when it come up i would you know research it it's only been the last five years that i started really digging deep into it and remembering some of the things that um you know i experienced 
And I experienced something big in the woods one time and I, I'd snuck up on it, not knowing it was there. And it, it kind of exploded in front of me, away from me. And I was in so I was in shock that I hadn't seen it and I'd snuck up on it and it was so big and it went away so fast. I don't know what it was to this day. It was big and brown and it was in four wheel drive mode. I mean, it was, it wasn't on two legs, whatever it was. Um, but there was nothing else uh, in that part of Illinois that um, we don't have bears there or anything. So it was something big. And then when I was at Fort Bragg um, in the Q course, I had to go in and see the company commander. And so I was a lieutenant at the time. And I, um, I went into his office and he wasn't there yet. So I had to wait on him. And there was, there was a folder on his desk. And there was this big eight by 10 picture in the folder that was, that was opened up. It was right there on top. You could see it. And so I kind of look at it and I'm like, huh, that's a pretty big wolf. Whatever it was had been shot or killed. And so I'm looking at it. I'm like, wow, that's big. And I assume it was around there. I don't know why he would have it on his desk if it wasn't. And I didn't, I'm looking at it just, Wondering, you know, I wonder how big that thing really is. It's laying on its side. It was dead. And I didn't think much about it until I saw its paw, which wasn't a paw. It was like a hand. And I'm looking going, what the hell is this? And then I heard him coming, you know, so I jumped back away from his desk. And you know, he walks in, walks behind his desk and closes the folder, which had some other pictures in there. I never saw them. And so that was my first, um, first time I had any inkling about uh, dog man, you know, so, uh, but since then, um, I've been the last four years, um, much heavier researching these things. And I had some investigative duties, um, over the years in the military, you know, you get assign, assigned to be an investigating officer. And then later as a senior leader, I was assigning people to be investigating officers for various things. And so, attention to detail and just, you know, double checking and cross referencing and doing all that kind of stuff. And so that's, um, you know, when Victor came on the scene, I thought, well, this, this sounds a little too good to be true. And so I just kind of paid attention and paid attention and started making, you know, notes of things. And I do that with, with others too, but in his case, um, his information was, was so detailed and so new and very raw, you know, in its context. And so it's, um, I said, well, let me, let me uh, pay attention to this for a while and see what I can turn up, you know, through my other means to verify some of the stuff. And so there were a few episodes where, um, and, and I think TJ did kind of the same thing, but I kind of, I don't want to use the word bait, but I, I put part of a story out there and left some of the details out. And in one case, he, he completed the story for me and he was correct on location. Oh, we're and, and we're jumping I, ahead. We're jumping ahead. I'm sorry. <laughs> so anyway, that's um, I'm retired now and, uh, from the military. I'm still working and I live in the D.C. area. So over to TJ. OK, great. Yeah, so our next uh, panelist is going to be T.J. Neely, and T.J. Neely has actually written a book, and he's going to tell us about that after he does his introduction and bio and how he got into this field. Go ahead. T.J.? There's a little bit of a delay. He'll catch up. Can you hear us, T.J.? Hey. Guys, hey, go question. ahead. I think yeah, I've got a little issue on this end. Can you hear me? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, so I'll go ahead and get started. Yeah, I spent uh, twenty years, twenty years in active, active duty in the U.S. Army, and uh, eight of those years was on the special operations side. And I was part of special teams, doing all kinds of interesting stuff. Um, did a lot of uh, foreign military sales work uh, through our State Department. Um, did um, um, a lot of information operations and, and a lot of our major campaigns. Um, uh, much of it was in, in psyops, 
the tactical, strategic, and operational. Did a lot of uh, 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 counter focus, counter drug, and counter uh, terrorism work with uh, JTF six at the time. It's it's called Joint Task Force North today, and that that was very exciting. Um, a very fulfilling career. Uh, learned a lot. Um, you know, shooting, communicating, surviving, sustaining. Um, you know, skill sets that you carry with you, uh, you know, way into your your lifetime. And uh, I was able to to gain or, or rely on a lot of that in, in my research as an independent Sasquatch, and it's really helped me out. And uh, I have actually seen all three witnessed firsthand with my own eyes uh, multiple Bigfoot, uh, only one werewolf, which was up in, uh, in New Mexico. And, uh, and then I've seen the dog man multiple times in and around here in northern Alabama in the uh, Wheeler Wildlife Refuge. And uh, I've, I've included, actually, I published a book in July of last year, 2020, it hasn't even been out a year yet. And, and that effort was, uh, um, it was a labor of love, basically, because I was sitting on all of this material for all of these years. And, and uh, I, if, if it wasn't in a book and get it out so other people know with any encounters that they've experienced in their lifetime. And so I ended up doing that and, and I'm very happy with it. And, and it's written for the people. Uh, and, um, but it all started for me. It all started for me is back in uh, 1984 when I came face to face with a nine foot four inch Sasquatch up in Washington state. And uh, it was late, late at night around three o'clock in the morning. And uh, we were on a, a field training exercise as part of our ROTC program. And uh, I was the only one uh, awake and, and on fire guard when this huge Sasquatch just freaking walks right into our campsite. And, uh, and it was just him and me. And uh, that story is in the book uh, with all the details. Um, it was very, very interesting. And, and, and it, it kind of shakes you up a little bit and, and changes your entire perspective on life. When, when you're sitting there looking at something, experiencing something firsthand that we're all told does not exist. And, uh, and it's just an amazing thing. And uh, so, so that was the turning point for me in my life. It's like, my gosh, if, if I'm, if what I'm looking at does exist and it is a real creature, it is a monster. It, it looked like, you know, uh, a slender Hulk, a nine foot, four inch Hulk with dark skin and, and dark hair, about four inches long, uh, you know, six inches off the elbows and other areas like the groin and, and uh, more hair off of the, the head and the, the face. But it was an amazing experience, and uh, it meant us no harm. We just happened to be in its way. It was heading down to the valley for breakfast at sunup, and um, it it, uh, uh, it stumbled upon us, and and they walked around us heading that and and. Um, even though I have experienced uh, Bigfoot or Sasquatches multiple times uh, in the years to follow, because nothing uh, violent or aggressive happened with this thing. They, they, this one first encounter was like a blessing in disguise because it was so intelligent. This creature was so intelligent. And, and it was just, I just knew what its intentions were. And, and uh, I sat there and uh, acknowledged its presence and he had acknowledged my presence and I showed respect. I didn't get all crazy and jump up and go running off into the woods, <laughs> into the dark of the night or wake up the rest of the camp. We had like uh, 12 to 15 other people all in their sleeping bags 
laying around snoring, snoring away. And, and I, I just accepted the fact that, okay, he's here, uh, you know, what's going to happen. And he walked around us and then he left. It was, it was a, an awesome experience. And so I kind of, I kind of was, um, broken in early in my research to to respect these creatures and realize that not all of them are out to kill you and eat you they these things want to they're very curious and and they they can sense what is in your heart and your mind as far as your intentions and if you mean it no harm and you you respect it and you show it the proper consideration it it will return that back to you tenfold and um and i have experienced that time and time again over the last 36 years in all of my research but that was the turning point for me uh i've had many 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 experiences and um i'm actually in the process of of writing a second book because i had way too much material for the first book and i wanted to get it out there on what i know and and i wanted to share with the world just uh just because I believe everybody else needs to know this stuff too. So I'm, I'm in the process of working on a second book that hopefully I can get out, uh, if not by the end of this year, or early next year. And, and uh, it's going to be kind of like a sequel and, and include even more stories um, that weren't, were not included in the first book. But um, uh, that's how it all started for me, pretty much. And TJ, give Back us the name John. of the book. Yeah, give us the name of your book. Yeah, there's a little bit of a delay for TJ. Anyway, TJ's book is called Revelations, The Human Hominid Connection. That's Revelations, The Human Hominid Connection. Yeah, it can the be- name of the book is uh, called Revelations, The Human Hominid Connection. Let's see if I can get it up here on the screen. There you go. And the uh, artwork, is, the digital artwork on the, the cover is done by my wife. She's a graphic designer Ooh. and uh, software engineer for GE. So she does great work. But I, I made sure that all the pictures in here from my research that supported everything that I share in here was in uh, color. Because if it's in black and white, like I've realized or noticed in other books, you really can't tell what it is the author is, is trying to, to share with you. Um, so I went ahead and, and made sure that that uh, Amazon printed all these pictures in in color, so that's that's good. Right. Uh, I want to give a shout out to Dark Waters who just joined the room. So hi, Dark Waters. Thanks for having you here. And uh, and Sean Graham and Wes was uh, was popping in for a minute. I think he had to leave. Um, but yeah, thanks for for promoting the book. And by the way, that can be found on Amazon.com on Amazon uh, and. Uh, I talked to uh, Jeff uh, Nadalny uh, earlier, and he said that book is an absolute must-read. So, um, so if anyone's interested, uh, yeah, I thought that was that was really nice praise. But yeah, uh, someone asked why we're talking about we're debating Victor, and that's because he's a very controversial subject in this field, and he's presented a lot of original information. Therefore, uh, I think it's worth. Uh, discussion about him being vetted as to whether he should be considered a credible source or not. And so that's the purpose of the show tonight and why we're here and why we're doing the panel with some people that uh, a lot of people have had, like I said before, a lot of people have had a lot of opinions on Victor and I've heard a lot from different people, but uh, these two guys have done research and had experiences with Victor that other people haven't had. And that's why I brought them on because they can give a uh, unique perspective towards uh, whether or not Victor is a credible source or not. And should thus should his original information to the field be taken uh, credible or seriously or not. Um, so that's the point of the, of the show tonight, just again for everybody. But why don't we, since y'all have introduced yourselves, why don't we go ahead and, and jump into that? Um <laughs> Hunter, uh, first of all, while you were smoking on that, or, or, or you know, warming up, incubating that stogie, if you will, all I could think about is, man, I love it when a good plan comes together. That the only thing that was playing in my head that whole time, <laughs> while TJ was talking. <laughs> but anyway, um, 
So, so Hunter, why don't you tell us um, tell us about Victor and what you've discovered with your research? Okay, so um, yeah, I'm not any more qualified than anybody else. So, um, but um, I was in the process, like TJ, I was writing a book on cryptids, and there's a lot of content in there that I'm using. Well, I had as placeholders that came from some of Victor's testimony and, and whatnot. Um, so, and the only reason I use, was using his stuff is I was able to verify some of the things that he, he claimed. Um, and I think back on, on May 5th, I'll have to double check the date, but um, uh, for, for May, I had, I had written some questions in for Jeff and Jeff um, asked Victor, and one of those questions had to do with part of a story about some mercenaries that were hired to hunt dogmen in the Appalachians. And I asked Victor if he was aware of this particular group of people. They were from a company called Leviathan. And this happened back in 2013. And his response was, yes, he was very familiar with them. And he gave he he finished the story for me. I never told him what state they were. This was this occurred in. He says, "Yeah, it was in Kentucky," <clears throat> and they ran into five of them. And I guess um, they were told they weren't welcome, and they might be buried in shallow graves somewhere in the Appalachian Mountains right now. So um, that kind of matched. Well, that more than matched what I had on that particular um, story. So. That was something that uh, he shouldn't have known, and he he knew it. And there was another one that's that's uh, less than um, he didn't he didn't have the same amount of credibility in this next one. But um, somebody else might argue that point, and that had to do with a story about. This guy, Zach, that had multiple encounters with a werewolf down in Alabama. And he had followed Victor's guidance on um, how to behave when you encounter this type of creature. And he did, and it worked. And um, he had many encounters with this that were not um, deadly, let's say. They were actually friendly encounters with this creature. And they, it actually spoke. Uh, so, you know, that was something that I don't think anybody in our community knew about until Victor revealed it. And then it was put to the test, you know, by somebody who basically followed Victor's guidance on how to behave when you encounter this kind of creature. And it worked. And then, of course, I was tracking um, the same thing that. You know, TJ will tell his story, but I was I was tracking TJ's story too when when Victor came on and finished it. So I'll let TJ talk. So those were the two episodes in particular um, for me that um, that that were I think the most uh, revealing about what he actually does. Um, and there's some little things that that are less. Um, important to this, uh, much smaller that um, he was able to complete or discuss that we were able to verify a couple of times when it came to times and places that um, I didn't think he should have known about. So, and he's been pretty pers consistent on, on some of his stuff, you know, particularly about the LBL. Um, I have all those references and that was um, that's part, that's part of the, uh, actually that's part of the story of, uh, that's going to be in the book I'm writing that I had just completed a draft and sent it over to TJ to peer review and, you know, P TJ cut it up and came back with some feedback. And then of course this Roger guy comes forward as a witness. And so part of my story involves, um, Victor's testimony as he was revealing this um, from the notes his father took when his father was on that hunt. Now, there are some things that um, I have a theory 
uh, coming from the Intel world, the, the Intel folks and the counterintelligence people, they put out some disinformation. And so I think the thing that scared a lot of researchers away from Victor was some of us were getting kind of close and some of us were getting kind of um, very pointed in our questions. And so I think he felt he may have been getting triangulated uh, in a couple of ways, or he put out a little too much information and his agency told him, hey, you need to back off. You're, you're revealing too much. Now, this is just a theory, so I, I can't say it's true. Uh, but then he started putting out some questions, some stories that were, they were pretty grandiose. Uh, I mean, they were over the top in, in many ways. And, you know, TJ and I and John and I did a couple autopsies on, on a couple of them. And we kind of thought it would have been really, really hard to make that story plausible in the way it was delivered. Now, there may have been some truth in there, but the, the stuff around it uh, was so over the top, it would have been, I don't want to say impossible, but highly improbable that it could have occurred the way it was told. So um, and I think that drove a lot of people away. And that's where you know some people have you know, called him a con man or a fake or, or whatnot. Um, and I don't think that's, I don't think that's the truth. I think he was trying to shed off some people that were getting too close and his whole uh, delivery was about educating the people and what we would call a soft disclosure on these cryptids and how to behave if you encounter them, what to do and what not to do. Cause more and more people were having encounters. Um, some of those encounters are fatal. I mean, when you look at, um, you know, just like animal attacks. Well, wild dogs and probably bears and mountain lions take the most blame in probably that order when in fact, not all of them are that. So, but that's, that's pretty much um, my experience in, in digging into, you know, who he really is. And Victor's not his real name either. Victor Johnson's not his real name. I, I know that. So, um, but, um, I'll let TJ tell his story because TJ has got a really good one on, on how he helped establish credibility of who Victor really was. So TJ. There's a little bit of a delay. It'll take a second for him to come on. Okay. All right. So I'll, I'll, let me go ahead and step in. Um, I discovered Jeff Nadalny's channel back when I was still writing my book in, in early of 2020. And I pinged him and asked some questions and, and, and then his guest Victor came on and I was tracking that. And I said, wow, this is pretty awesome. It's almost too good to be true, but you know what? This guy is coming forward with some information that kind of jives with my own research for the past 36 years. And, and just take, Techniques, tactics, procedures, some of the things, that, you know, that he talks about that only someone operating or working in that field would know. And so on back channels, I was via email, I was sending Jeff some some questions for Victor. And I had some concerns because I my whole back 40 is nothing but a, a wild and woolly swamp back here, the Wheeler Wildlife Refuge in, in northern Alabama, northeastern Alabama. And I have seen two of the big three out here uh, on many occasions. And uh, um, there was actually one situation where I had just finished up some yard work and uh, this story is in the book in, in excruciating detail. And I hear this, this morning, forlorn, long howling going on about a kilometer away coming from the, the swamp. And it's, it basically sounded like a, a, a hybrid uh, bloodhound just, just bellowing into the night. Uh, the sun had, had just set, and and it's like, wow, what the hell is this creature? I said, this is not a Bigfoot, because I've heard many Bigfoot sound, you know, sounding off at night. And I said, oh, man, this, this, is, this is a dog man. This has got to be a dog man. 
and because I knew they were in the area. So, so that night passes. The next day, it's like you know what? It, if this thing starts to call out into the night again, I want to get on over there in the swamp and I want to try to record it, get a good audio recording on it. So I packed up my gear and slipped into the swamp in the uh, north north side between the two housing areas in the swamp, found a nice place to, to settle down. And I was just there for about three hours. And um, <clears throat> it was dark and everything got really quiet. And then all of the sudden, um, all hell breaks loose with, with automatic weapon fire for about 10 seconds, like a meeting engagement going on until the enemy's put down. And then everything, everything, everything goes dead quiet again. So I'm using, I'm looking my thermal monocular for heat signatures like oh man this is somebody's in here some business uh and and i, I just happened to be witnessing it all go down and i could i actually saw oh the uh the the, the rifle flashes the gun flashes off off of the trees it just lit up calibers you know one it seemed like one got this real strange feeling it's like you know what if somebody's in here you know uh doing some serious business that i need to find my way back out so i did so i i went on back home and uh and then the very next day the very next day coming back from work these two helicopters a a M I A. Oh. Oh uh, wow. So, yeah. So the two helicopters that came in it was an M I A um, Russian helicopter and a C H forty seven. They landed uh, at the FARP out at the FOB at um, um, Redstone Arsenal. So. And this happened back in, um, uh, it was 28 October 2016. So the time frame that, that this happened. And I was tracking this story too through, through another source. And then TJ came on. I'm like, oh, you were there. Okay, great. And so um, I'll try to continue until he gets back on and can tell the rest of it. Right. Um, the short of it was he was... Um, he had snuck out there to see if he could hear this creature again. And so he, he's out there in the swamp close to where this, he had heard the, the howling the evening before. And he's sitting there, TJ, you're back. It'll take him a second. Yeah, I'm back. Can you hear me? Yeah. We were just talking about you sitting in the swamp and um, the helicopters, you know, came in and whatnot. Yeah, good, good. So, so happening in succession, and and I'm starting to put it all together and say, you know what, this is painting a completely different picture here. Here I've got this this loud dog man, forlorn, howling into the night, like it's like it's mournful, and then and then I've got this firefight going on, and I'm in the the swamp witnessing all of this. And then we've got cargo helicopter. And uh, so then then I, I just get this wild hair of an idea. Well, let me talk to Jeff and and, and send a question in to, to Victor. And, and Victor uh, on a back channel uh, through Jeff said, hey, um, tell me a little bit more. So I shared the rest of the information. And lo and behold, Victor came forward with details and filled in the blanks. And he says, yes, I at that point in time, that date, that night, I was in the, that swamp at the same time, uh, and I, I re removed three dogmen. Uh, all three were male. Uh, um, all three were part of the prison. And we just had to find that very interesting in the book. But um, and then the the dialogue continued after that, and and actually Victor filled in a lot of blanks that I had within my own research, uh, talking about the big three. I knew 
I already knew that three different uh, uh, creatures, um, the Bigfoot or Sasquatch, uh, the werewolf and, and the dogman type creatures existed, but I didn't refer to them as the big three until Victor says, oh yeah, the big three, there you have it. And uh, so it was very interesting. And, and, and in my special ops experience, the, um, I've worked with a lot of spooks. We call the CIA guys the spooks because you know they're they're doing intel collection like we're doing and everything else. And and when we put the special teams together, uh, nine out of ten times we have them on the teams and all. And and so in my analysis of of, uh, of Victor, this this character that that uh, that we're talking about, I mean, I I think he was he was truly the special agent in charge of this black unit that shows up. Um, uh, whenever you have cryptids uh, behaving badly and, and they does the, his teams do the cleanup and they hunt down, uh, the ones that uh, committed the, uh, the atrocity or the crime and, and, uh, life goes on to the next case. But, um, so I had to think, I said, I, I know some guys in, in the, uh, in the agency and, and, uh, I, I'm thinking that Victor was part of the special activity center, the, the SAC for, uh, tactical mm -hmm. paramilitary operations in support of, uh, our country's war fighting capability. And, um, it's, it's a special program and it's, it's a black program. Definitely. So, uh, I, I, I believe that a lot of, of what Victor had to say and what he has shared with us, because he's using Jeff's channel, uh, for, for a soft disclosure because we all know the government's not going to come forward with a full disclosure um so i, I i'm 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 uh oh, i give him you know credit i believe he's more real than than a lot of people say he is so tj when uh when you talk about the sac the special um what was it activity center yeah uh that with the black projects we're any of the people you talked to, were they able to confirm at yeah, all? The SAC? Yes. Were they able to confirm about Victor at all when you talked to them? As far as whether he worked there or were they not able to say anything like that? For the audience, there's going to be a delay. Uh, but in, in my... Uh... <laughs> Did he freeze? <laughs> no, not by name. Not, not by name. Yet. Okay, not by so no, not by name. Hunter, you'll All have right. to fill in some blanks because I'm I'm kind of broken. All right, so right. so yeah, the 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 SAC. There's actually two groups. There's the SAC, and then there's the PAG, the Political Action Group. So Victor was part of the SAC. I I don't know that to be a hundred percent. Um, but that's um, where I think his unit falls under is the SAC. Now, it's it's not easy researching um, those particular um, organizations, even if you have a clearance. And I have top secret clearance, but um, you, one, you, ha you have to have a need to know. Um, I don't have a need to know. I was curious. And so I had to tread lightly in, in, in that direction. So. Um, I could not confirm, John, that that was for sure right. his, his organization. Now, I know where they're out of. They're a couple hours south of me. Um, where are South. they out of? So they're in D.C. Or, or? Virginia. Virginia. So they are out of Virginia. So that leads to the story. Yeah. So that's if you get to if you look on the map close to Williamsburg, you'll see where they are. OK. Well. You might see where they are. You'll know, you have to know where to look. There's a there's a place down there across from Williamsburg. Right, right. So. Okay, so basically, just a, a recap for the audience because it was a little difficult following along with with TJ being the the connection's not really good, and I apologize for that, everybody. But um, basically, with with these two researchers slash witnesses, if you will, are 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 explaining is they were able to speak with Victor about specific cases uh, and incidences where Victor was able to give more details than they gave, but fully collaborated the, the story and fully corroborated his story 
that uh, that he knew more about the details of these things that an average person just making this stuff up would have had no access or idea to complete these details. Um, so that I, I, we, the three of us believe that that lends a huge credibility towards uh, Victor being a, uh, a credible source of information. Now, some people have, have been asking me, why are we even discussing Victor uh, while we're talking here? And they're just, they're saying, why are, why these guys? Uh, uh, and, and why are we even bringing up this subject? And, and I'll, I'll address that. First of all, both of these men are, are, are military brass with full careers in the military and in special operations and access groups. They understand the lingo. They understand the terminology. They understand the, the lifestyle and how these things work. So, that's the kind of people you want to vet a story about someone who claims to be from the area that Victor's in. We're not going to get someone from Victor's section that's going to show up and just uh, say, oh, yeah, you know, we collaborate all this. We're talking a lot of uh, a lot of black projects and things like that. So these are the kind of people you need that have the background and experience to be able to discuss this. Just a dog man researcher is not going to have this kind of information or background that these two that these two guests have on this panel to be able to stand up and 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 verify this information to the to the level that they are. So I think that's very important. And when somebody comes and claims to be a new witness with the level of information that Victor claims to be from as far as a source and the the, the information he's putting out, especially the uh, a lot of original information that we're not getting from other sources. It deserves to be vetted, and it deserves to be vetted by the community, and it deserves to be vetted by researchers and people, people that are, are listening to that information. So that, that's another reason as to why. But we're not trying to attack Victor. I want to make that clear. We're certainly not trying to attack Jeff uh, Nadalny. Jeff's a friend of mine, and I spoke to him today, told him we were doing this show. And on top of that, uh, I told him what our goal is. And what we're trying to say, we're talking pros and cons for Victor, but what we've been able to try to establish here is the fact that that Victor was able to be knowledgeable about certain specific situations that no one would have had information for if they weren't legitimate. So that's that's where we're going. Right. So, so, John, on that, I can um, give people some references to um, – to go and, and pull the same information I did. So like it's a secret or anything. Now, granted, they might not be able to find some of the other things I've talked about, but for sure. And another great example, if you guys got pen and paper ready to write, I want you to write down this. 3 July 2020. Dog Man, a Connecticut encounter and update in Taylor, Mississippi. So that's Luke's encounter. And Victor finished the story for Luke as well. And his guys showed up. So again, that's 3 July. It's an episode on Jeff's channel. Dogman, a Connecticut encounter and update in Taylor, Mississippi. Another good example where Victor knows a whole lot more than he's supposed to about that. Um. And now if you also go to 4 May 2020, that's episode 35, Dog Man, Two Terrifying Subscriber Encounters, and Q&A with Government Agent. A great friend of mine and fellow researcher, he's way smarter than me, he goes by the name of Wolfka. So Wolfka asked a question that I, I revealed earlier that had to do with um, the uh, mercenaries that were hunting the fox man. And that's the one that, that Victor knew about and um, finished the story with the location, something I didn't reveal. Well, Wolfka didn't reveal to him. And I didn't reveal that to, to Wolfka. And when I got the answer back, I showed him, see, Kentucky. I never told him that. He offered that information up. So if you want to go to that episode, again, that's 4 May, episode number 35. 
dog man, two terrifying subscriber counters, and Q&A with government agent. And I think, uh, well, um, TJ's story is in his book. Um, so you, you, can, you can see that in the book, too. And you'll see, um, I don't remember the episode that um, Victor talked about the fob, um, but he did talk about it. And then the rest of the story, uh, you know, TJ put in his book. So the chapter in my book, it, so I'm writing a book, it's a draft, but there's a chapter in there that talks about a whole bunch of, of different incidents. And I actually have um, a placeholder in there for the fob at, um, at Redstone Arsenal. And a bunch, yeah. So that would have been like one November 2016. And your TJ had his encounter on 28 October. So it was getting wrapped up on one November, I believe. Um, now he talked about this, and it would take me a while to dig this out, but he describes the, the three dog men that they killed there. You know, the shortest one, the smallest one being 6'10, 340 pounds, the largest was 7'8 and weighed in at 353 pounds, and they were all from the program, released at different times. So, um, again, get TJ's book, and you, you, can, you can nail that right away. So, right. Um, so, yeah, there's, there's a lot of good comments um, in here, and, I, and I've tracked a whole bunch of this stuff. So um, someone made the comment that he hunts dog man with his Desert Eagle. Well, no, the Desert Eagle is his sidearm. He hunts dogmen, as he claims, with um, automatic weapon, 308. So I don't know if it's an AR-10 or whether it's um, an FN or, you know, which which brand it is. But And they have extended magazines, so they get more than just, you know, 30 rounds. And armor-piercing so rounds or yeah. special, special hot loads by the agency. All right. And then for the Bigfoot, he's always claimed he uses a 458 Win Mag, you know, for the big stuff. So... And Those he's used three weapons. He's used that on dogmen and werewolf as well, but but his main go-to for that is the on the on Bigfoot, he said. Right. So um and, and so one of the reasons that uh, John wanted to talk about this, not to mention there are a lot of people out there that have um you know either you know love Victor or hated him, you know. Right. So it's there, there are a few people that are in the middle. Some people are holding judgment, and, and yeah, they should. But if, if they're curious enough, they can dig in. And I will tell you that there are no absolutes in this field. You're not going to get a, a cryptid to come in and do an interview. You're not going to get a cryptid to come in for a picture. Um, you're not going to have a body show up in your uh, driveway, you know, that a friend dropped off. So this, this is very, you know, tight kept and you can you can listen and research any story you want and i've done dozens and dozens and the one thing that they're all lacking is evidence i mean the lbl for example we were going to talk about that soon and other people have and i've written um about it um you know this you got the this is probably the most persistent story the exception being um, the Patterson Gimlin film. And in this one, we have no evidence. There's no creature. There's no bodies. There's no camper. Now, there's no nothing. Yet this story has persisted in the absence of evidence for so long. Um, you know, it kind of, it kind of begged to be investigated again. So I'm writing this draft combining three different stories when this guy Roger shows up. And so at, at the time I was writing my draft, combining three different stories that actually tell a, uh, the whole story, I think, or the, the truth that we're looking for. Now, I don't like to use that word truth only because it, it's we don't know. I mean, none of us were there. Even the people that wrote about him were not there. I mean, they're getting their information from other you know, witnesses. So as I finished up my draft and gave it to TJ for you know, peer review, to just say, hey, what do you think? You know, I'm combining elements of Kumbo's story, of Victor's story, 
and of Jan Thompson's story. And I think we got a more complete story combining them than having three separate stories of three different views, um, looking through three different lenses um, at different at different things and different times. And so I, I always thought that um, it would be nice if somebody could put together the elements of these stories and combine them into one story. And so I'd attempted to do that. And then Roger comes forward and he's got a whole bunch of new information that's what I would call pre-attack. So I break that story up into phases. You got pre-attack, you have attack, and then you have um, post-attack, and then you have the hunt. Um, none of those stories by themselves covers you know, that whole that whole thing. So in doing this, discussing with John, John's like, well, you know, there's a lot of people that aren't going to take Victor's testimony that serious. And so, so John and I went back and forth for probably a few months uh, talking about things. I know one of John's hangups has been with um, the colors of eyes. So, right. So, yeah. yeah. So, so when it comes to Victor, I want to talk about pros and cons. And one of the right. things for me personally in, in my journey, I, I've tried to listen to everything that Victor has said. Uh, I don't know if I've listened to absolutely every single story, but I, I've, I've heard probably 90, 98, 99% of them. So, um, but one of the hangups I personally had in trying to figure out for myself, if I thought Victor was real or on the level, because a lot of stuff he says sounds very credible. And a lot of stuff he says sounds very outlandish. And being that he's adding completely new material, it really makes you wonder. Victor is the first person that I've heard in the field that really made a distinction between dogmen and werewolves and being very adamant that they're two different species that do not share DNA other than the fact that they have human genes in both of them. So um, I already knew in my own research, I had come to the full conclusion that our government has had that. First of all, these things have, have come from our past and have always been here, but also that our government has had full breeding programs and super soldier programs with these things. So when Victor came out talking about that stuff, that only confirmed things I already knew and believed. But some of the things I struggled with as far as Victor's testimonies, every story I've heard, or at least 90% of the stories that people have told me about their encounters, they claim that these creatures have yellow, amberish eyes, whether it be a dogman or werewolf. And Victor's very adamant that the dogmen have red eyes and the werewolf have the amber color eyes. So some people have suggested their eyes can change colors. I don't know, but that was one of the hangups for me. No, and um, that's, that's a good point. And I think that um, from Victor's perspective, um, it, he gets the red eyes because the breeding program that he discussed they picked out a particular type of breeding stock for the dogman and they modeled them after Raphael. Now Raphael was jet black with red eyes. The other breeding males were the same way. Um, Raphael, um, if he was in fact euphonized at the time of his last summer, he was nine foot six and a pretty formidable creature. Um, and it took two of them to deal with him at a time. One had to provide overwatch. Um, it wasn't like Sebastian, uh, as Victor claimed, where he could go in and have a conversation with him. They still had to be careful around Raphael. So, but Raphael was the model in which they wanted to create uh, their army of dogmen. So you got red eyes. And like you said, all the ones they produced had red eyes. All the ones they released had red eyes. Um, and so where, where that deviates is the encounters people have and they report different colored eyes. And so I've, I've heard just about every color um, you can imagine. Um, now there's, I don't want to talk about this right now, but there's another theory that um, in my book that I'm, I'm exploring and it does talk about the different colored eyes of the dogmen and the Bigfoot. Um, it's just too raw to, to 
get into it and bring it up right now. But because it's if if you're on the fence about this, this will just drive you away. So I, I don't want to bring it up. But there's there's something else going on out there that's that's beyond um, right. Well, anything so, that Victor's done or talked about. So we can't drop bombs and then say we didn't just throw a grenade. But but I agree yeah. with you. So let's move on. <laughs> yeah. So. So yeah, there's there's different sources for the the colored about colored eyes, um, so that's that's what I'm trying to get at. Right, right, yeah. So um, uh, yeah. So another another issue I had with uh, with Victor's testimony is yeah, a lot of times they send a whole team in, team gets wiped out, then all of a sudden Victor by himself goes in as a relatively old man with a way super high rank. And uh, it comes in and saves the day. And that's weird because it reminds me of like Star Trek with Captain Kirk. Captain Kirk is the you know, captain of the starship, but he's always on the away team. No, if you have the rank, you're not on the away team. You send the underlings on the away team. You know what I'm saying? So that yeah, was something else. You're signed for a multi-trillion dollar starship and you're on the away team. <laughs> you know? <laughs> right, right. Yeah, exactly. So, um and, and what's the purpose of you being the captain if you're not on the ship? You know, <laughs> you know what I mean. So that was that was another issue I, I had personally had with, or, or you know, or these these stories. You know, so real. That's, that's an example where um, I think some disinformation probably was inserted to push people like me and you away from getting too close and paying too close attention. Well, that that's certainly my, that's up. my theory. Your theory that certainly brings up the issue of him claiming his death and then and coming back, you know, because right. I tell you that was a that was a major stumbling block. Like some of the people in the chat room have have mentioned uh, here is that um, oh hey by the way uh, Jeff just joined the show so let's give a shout out to Jeff and and uh, and Jeff too if you're wanting to come on we can try to bring you in as well, um, but. Um, if, if you can, but, um, but anyway, I was saying that that was another, that was another hang up for me at the time was I had got, I, I fell in love with Victor with these stories. And then all of a sudden, uh, he claims that he died and man, when he died, you can, you can ask Jeff. I sent right before that, when he was on the run, I sent Jeff an email before he ever knew me before we ever talked. And I was like, man, this pisses me off. And I'm like, dude, I got nothing to lose. I was like, I'll, I'll hide Victor out at my house. I'll go wherever he is, and I'll uh, I'll bring my weapons and I'll back him up. I'll fight with him to the death. I, I you know, our, our government turning against our own people. It's BS. And I was like, I, and of course, he rightly, you know, didn't respond to that. I, in hindsight, I wouldn't have either, probably, you know. But I was very upset about that situation. And, and when they said that uh, when he died. I was very angry. I was very angry. And then, um, and then when he finally came back later and was like, Oh, I'm alive again with, uh, some, some story about why that really threw me for a loop. So I knew it threw other people for a loop as well. No, you're absolutely right. And that was, um, that was certainly, I think the breaking point for a lot of people that were uh, otherwise on the fence that hadn't bolted earlier. Right. Right. But, like we've we've talked about in this discussion so far, um, these men have been able to verify that Victor was able to give more information about topics than than they gave him, and he was able to fully collaborate that information. Plus, with their military backgrounds, they're able to to assess out whether someone really sounds like they're coming from these specific areas or not. And thus far, there's no reason. Why, um, why to, to, to say that from that standpoint that he would not be legitimate at this point, you know? Yeah. So there's been a lot of good comments in the chat and yes, I, I agree with a couple of folks that's, Hey, there's no experts in this field. You're absolutely right. right. And I think that every researcher probably considers themselves a perpetual student, um, you know, until, until something can be proven. And as I've said before, the best you can hope for at this point um, when reviewing some of this material is a plausible outcome. Now, um, 
for people that aren't familiar with cryptids, plausibility is not going to go very far. Uh, for people that have been studying the cryptid field for a while, they still understand exactly what I'm talking about. All right, is that plausible? Because you're not going to get, you know, proof is 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 very rare. And you can go and scour the internet and you'll find that there's not a lot of proof there. Um, I, I really want to just, and, I, and you know, if Jeff is, or not Jeff, um, if um, John's cool with that, I would gladly give up all my research material and actually put it on, you know, a, a safe place where people could access it and we could share it with other researchers. I mean, I don't want some, you know, drive by people just snatching up my stuff and, claiming it's theirs, but collaborating with other people. Um, Cause I, I, you know, some of these theories, you know, I can push so far. There are other people that are in positions to, to take them farther and I'm way okay with that. So in this particular case, um, I'm not going to claim I have the end all be all by any means. Uh, and I am ready to, you know, to cast everything aside for a truth any day of the week. So it's um, some of these things have a shelf life and you, you, you think you're, you're onto something and then something else new and is revealed. That's um, let's say proven that changes everything. And that's a good thing because as people in the audience want to know is they want to know the truth and you're not going to get that from the government. You're not going to get that from the media and you're not going to get that from science. Um, those three groups which are important are all absent when it comes to uh, cryptid studies, cryptid verifications, or cryptid confessions. Um, those people, those three groups are working against you, not with you. And so that's why the, the community has, for those of you that are paying attention, has grown so much in probably the last two or three years. Sightings have gone up um, more and more. I don't want to use the word evidence, but more and more evidence is coming forward that we can piece together, you know, pieces of this missing puzzle. And that's what I've been doing for the last you know, few years. Um, you know, and Victor was kind of a, a breakthrough for a lot of things. You can go and listen to other channels right now and they won't know the difference between a dog man and a werewolf. Right. Right. And that's one of the biggest contributions by Victor. Right. Say so you, you go and look at some chart that they have where there's 13 different types and right. you know, one of them looks like Mickey Mouse with fangs and you yeah. know one's got looks like a baboon and uh, you know it's just one thing after the other uh, and I'm no fan of that chart I know John isn't either but I'm not I'm not either never have been so hey okay, guys can you hear I, me I'm back yes yeah, we can hear you okay we can hear you a a um. I had to commandeer my wife's computer. It's a little bit better. I've got a better connection. So uh, we're up and running again on this end here. You got, I'm sorry I dropped off. I got a bad connection uh, initially. Uh, do you have any questions for me or anything? Well, we're, we're coming to that. One thing I wanted to say before I forget about it, because I keep forgetting swinging back to it. But one thing I wanted to say is, yeah, going off of what you just said, um, one of the biggest things that Victor has given us as far as original information on the scene is that there is a difference between dogmen and werewolf. And no one else was talking about that except for Victor. All right. And I, since then, when, when I was on the fence and struggling with the legitimacy of Victor or not, I've been listening to several other people's encounters and people that have come to me for shows, excuse me, or eyewitnesses or people I've, I've talked to about cases. And, Many times, these are people that have never heard of Victor, yet they've given me clear, distinct descriptions of at one point having dealt with a dog man and at another confrontation having dealt with a werewolf. So even though they don't even know Victor, they haven't heard of him or his, his stories or information, they haven't listened to Jeff's show, but yet they were able to confirm just on their eyewitness testimony that there's two very distinct different types. And I've heard this from multiple sources now. So that's another thing for me personally that, that leads me to believe that Victor is very credible and that Jeff's done a fantastic job with Victor on his show. Yeah, the word that comes to my mind is, is legit because I actually saw a werewolf up in New Mexico long before I saw... 
uh, Eyes On, The Dog Man. And um, those two mm -hmm. stories are going to be in my next book, but you can actually catch them. I shared those with... Um, so you're a perfect with example, TJ, of what I was just saying. Leslie on Cryptids Canada, and uh, she, she posted those. Uh oh, well, so much for your wife's computer. <laughs> oh, I thought it was a big upgrade, but I guess it was. I know, I know, I know, right? What happened? What happened? No, but that's awesome. TJ just confirmed exactly what I said, where yeah. the, the example I was using as far as, as validating uh, Victor. But TJ, you back? I don't know. Or do we back on the delay? Hey, so, John, you know, one of the most, uh, so I've, Watched a lot of channels. Yeah, I'm um, running hot and cold on this last... connection for some reason. Now I'll, I'll have to troubleshoot it later. But yeah, <laughs> we're, we're getting that. So, um, so one of the th one of the questions that almost uh, every channel I I listen to, I almost turn it off after I hear this question. It's um, what do you think that thing is? <laughs> Well, they just gave you a description, and you're calling yourself a researcher. What do you think it is? It sounds right. like a dog man to me, or you know, right. it's uh, you know. So I hear some of these things. Some of those channels aren't around anymore. Um, uh, and it, every time that question came up, I just I just had to turn the channel after that. It was, um, and, and then this particular gentleman, um, and he had some interesting guests, and he had some really good material, but. Um, Maybe he was just a show host and not necessarily a researcher, but he claimed to be a researcher. And so that's where I was kind of disappointed that um, you know, I didn't get more out of or he didn't move the, the story uh, further along than I thought it should have gone. But, um, you know, these things happen. It's um, and I, I, I started paying a lot of attention uh, in the last three years and really kind of um, cross referencing stuff verifying things here and there and um you know and there are some professionals out there so i know dr jeff meldrum um i mean people have some some mixed views on him but he's confirmed that the the bigfoot's got a mid-tarsal break and i think if you look close enough you'll find that the werewolf does too now the dog man doesn't because the dog man has dog legs but um that mid tarsal break allows them to walk on all fours or on two legs. It allows them to climb quickly and comfortably across terrain that would be difficult for flat footed people to um, traverse. So humans are the only, um, the only being that has flat feet um, that I know of. Um, so this is why you see, you get reports of like Bigfoot climbing straight up, you know, a, a very steep hill very quickly and easily. Their foot, is, right. it's got the mid-tarsal break, so it allows them to, to articulate their foot in a way that allows them to do that. And the same thing right. can be said um, about the werewolf too. Although I can't necessarily confirm that I don't have a body or... Um, a track to study like uh, Dr. Meldrum's done with the you know, Bigfoot prints and whatnot. So. Right. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. We're having trouble with uh, TJ again. Can you hear me guys? I'm back. Yeah. That's, go it ahead. Sounds like a big upgrade. Yeah. I, I was hearing your, your audio and, and that is absolutely correct, Hunter. I, I think the way the feet are designed on some of these creatures it enables them to, um, not only walk repeatedly, but but it gives them the opportunity to to move swift and fast and quickly on all fours. Yeah. So the other thing about Victor, he's revealed in terms of their abilities, are things that um, heard about through various encounters and reports, but they sound so fantastic because our paradigm. Doesn't a human's paradigm does not line up with some of these incredible abilities? Right. So, the ability to run real fast and jump across the road in a single leap and you know lift a, a four wheel drive dually truck and turn it over and right. mind speak and all these other things that humans yep. can't do. Um, humans have a hard time um, grasping a creature. 
um, that's, that's like us, except different, that has these abilities because humans think they're the most advanced thing that's that's ever been in history. Right. And we think that we are in the most advanced society to date that uh, humanity's ever been through. Right. Um, I don't know if that's true because I've only lived through this life, but historically we found things that um, that are thousands of years old that can't, you know, to this day still be replicated or explained. I don't want to get off off subject, but just to prove what um, you know, Victor confirmed a lot of these things uh, with with very uh, minute detail on how and why they can do these things. And so, for the researchers that had a suspicion that these special abilities um, that cryptids possessed um, might have been hard to um, I guess, prove or accept, um, Victor made it seem matter of factly. And it is his testimony on these topics. Um, not only did it confirm what many researchers already knew or had reported or seen themselves, it added gravity and granularity to something that they didn't possess at the time of their sighting. Okay. Yeah, TJ. Yeah, that was very well said, Hunter. Um, I, I mean, it, I, I totally enjoy Jeff's channel, a great American, and I'm just, I was very pleased yeah. to, to to discover to discover um, this character Victor on his channel, and I think we all approach this cryptid world with with some in a very skeptic uh, way. And until we start seeing the connections and how things are tied together and how this is linked to that, and and if you're a researcher, um, I think you're 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 more you're into it more than just knee deep. There there are people out there that that have these encounters come to them, and then you have researchers that actually go out there to to facilitate these encounters and to see these things in the wild. And, and that's what I've been doing on my own because I love the great outdoors and I've been very lucky to, to actually observe these things uh, at a distance and, and accumulate a lot of data points, a lot of information that, that uh, helps tie a lot of this stuff that, that we are seeing on all these different channels and platforms that are out there because the people are experiencing these creatures in the flesh uh, on a daily basis. And, and these are things that we all know exist, but, but unfortunately our government is not willing to disclose the truth to, to us to let, to let us know that, yeah, we're all in the same boat. And I think the truth, the real truth that would come along with a, with a full disclosure would, would um, probably shake the very foundation that we're all standing on because we're all in this together, basically. I mean, it would most likely force the rewrite of our of our history, the history of right. mankind. I mean, we're talking creatures that that have existed down through time from our own in antiquity. Yeah. Um, and, and every continent on in this world served as a petri dish, you know, at some point in time. And that's what gives us the different variations that we're we're seeing. And we shouldn't be surprised, you know, when people start talking about type one through type 10. I, just look at human beings alone, guys. I'm telling you, <laughs> human beings, mankind, there are so many variations in colors and shapes and sizes. Well, look at dog that, genes. Exactly, exactly. So that I mean, that look how many species of species of dogs where they say they've got what 36 chromosomes, yet you mm -hmm. change one little thing and you've got big dogs, giant dogs, small dogs, you know, just across the gambit. So, yeah, and there's going to be, and if I, I think there's different breeding programs, so there's going to be differences in different breeding programs, or there's going to be differences that they're looking for from within even the same breeding program sometimes. They're going to be always trying to change variations and trying to see what they can improve upon or just test for uh, research purposes. Right. So uh, as well as other types of cryptids. And so, you can hey, never rule out man, man playing God. We, yeah. you know, we've been uh, in search of uh, super soldiers to create a super army for a very long time um, to give us the competitive edge over our adversaries, you know? So it's, it, it's all part of human nature. 
It doesn't right. surprise me at all. Right. Hey, so, John, there's a really good comment I'd like to address. Sure. Um, it's from Admira Thoria. There's too much tribalism in the crypto world, too much infighting, in my opinion. That also stagnates the field of study. You're absolutely right. And I can tell you, TJ and I have talked about this, you know, over and over. And it might be one of the biggest complaints um, we have. And um, I can tell you that I actually have started learning more about getting a lot more content from Steve's channel on how to hunt than I have been from the cryptid channels. Um, and that's, I think it's part of that is with the infighting and the competitiveness, instead of people wanting to work together, they want to work against each other. And, um, it, you'll find in my analysis on the LBL, the first people to come out and complain about it are the people that think they have something to lose. Um, they've, they've kind of drawn a line in the sand. Hey, this is the LBL story. There is no other. Uh, and I think that's very unfair to the people that are true seekers. It's very unfair to the family that were the victims of this. Um, and like like a lot of people in the audience are saying, yeah, I know all the three of us, we're just interested in the truth. And wherever the truth takes us, you know, I'm okay with. And I'm okay with discarding right. everything I've discovered at this point for, you know, a greater truth. So uh, I am not married to this stuff forever. So it's uh, wherever it takes us is, is where we're willing to go. It looks like we might be losing John. So, TJ, um, this upgrade that you have with the camera, why didn't you start out with that? <laughs> well, it's obvious yeah. that my wife has better technology than I do. <laughs> so uh, I think we'll have a different plan next time we get together and do this. But it seems to be working uh, much, much better. So we've adjusted, lifted, and shifted on the fly here. So um, I, I don't know how much of my earlier comments you guys were able to capture, but I'm wide open for questions uh, uh, if you guys want to. Well, yeah, you, you'd brought up earlier that in your experience, you've come across Bigfoot and uh, werewolves. Could you give us a little bit of detail um, that in your experience, uh, when you were in the military, uh, some of the uh, cryptids that you came across? Can you, are you able to talk about any of that? Well, um, in the book, I list... Uh, I was running counter drug, counter terrorism operations as part of JTF six down on the border. And uh, when we're doing night ops um, with the EOI balls, the we're picking up thermal signatures of, of everybody on the ground, you know, people trying to the immigration immigrants. We're talking about the border patrol. We're talking about any other, uh, you know, the drug runners, uh, uh, cartel folks, trying to get in across the border and and there every so often is a a a much larger thermal signature that shows up and he is keeping a distance he's obviously observing but he's keeping a distance from from all the parties involved and and whenever he is detected and 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 the the uh, interdiction team is sent in that direction he moves or it moves at a, a dramatic pace very quick very agile much larger a completely different thermal signature and and that is only one thing it, it it's either your southwest bigfoot or it's a werewolf type down there operating you know just out of curiosity because um if it was a dog man, it runs a little differently when it's when it's bipedal. Its its legs are different, and and it just moves a little different. And the the facial features are different. It's got the snout and the ears on top of the head, et cetera, et cetera. But um, from what I could tell, and I'd get called into the room and say, hey, uh, you know, what do you think about this? And and it says, well, this is this is not part of what we're looking for. This is uh, this is a third party out there. That's just kind of tracking and following uh, and, and uh, you know, playing. I guess he's playing in the middle of the night. So uh, with what we got going on, the operations is part of uh, entertainment or value or whatever. But uh, that was that was during those uh, three and a half years that I was working in, in that organization. But um, also another thing was uh, um, at Fort Polk, Louisiana. When we're doing gunnery, night gunnery operations, for example, you, we we detected uh, herds of wild horses out there in Louisiana, and um, at the same time, you pick up thermal 
uh, signatures of something else that looks like a man downrange, and you got to shut everything down, call the ceasefire, and and send vehicles down there and say, hey, you know, who's down here? You, you know, you're not supposed to be down here, and, and you never find it. You never find what that was down there, be, and and you can only write it off as, hey, that was your local uh, Bigfoot, you know, happened to happened to cross our range downrange and, and cause us to, to to call a ceasefire. So, I mean. In a, over a 20 year career, you know, if you know what to look for and, and you know what these things sound like, you know what they how they move, how they behave and what they smell like and, and all that stuff, um, you will come across these things uh, occasionally when you're out uh, on field training exercises or gunnery or what have you. But a lot of people, a lot of people come in contact. They, they are in this, you know, in the presence of these things and they have no idea how close they are to them. They think it's another soldier or what have you. Um, I was running, matter of fact, I was as a cadet uh, at Fort Lewis. And this uh, this story is also in the book. You know, we had a Bigfoot walk in to our, uh, our uh, night defensive position and was checking us out. It was walking in and out of each of us just checking us out. It was big. It was tall. It was kind of stinky, you know, wet, uh, uh, musky animal smell. It didn't have clothes on. It was all covered in hair and it, it didn't have any combat gear on. It wasn't carrying a weapon. And here I am, here I am for almost an hour looking at it through my nods saying, wow, this is really interesting. And the only reason why I was able to, to observe this creature was it, it wasn't aggressive. It, it wasn't uh, hurting anybody. It wasn't taking equipment. It wasn't doing anything. It was just uh, playing with us. It was toying with us because we were all under, it was pouring down rain. We're under our ponchos, you know, uh, waiting for uh, the, the mission to start. You know, we're going to do a first light uh, um, attack. And um, it, it was just amazing that this thing felt safe and secure enough uh, and confident enough to sneak in and out and around each and every one of us uh, and check us all out. And then and then when I would stand up to get a better look at it, it would go down on all fours. And then I'd go, well, that thing disappeared. I know it's not a human being. It's not one of us. So then I'd sit back down again and boom, you'd pop back up <laughs> and start walking around through all of us again. I mean, so to- and, and, and that's not the only story of this happening in the training areas in and around Fort Lewis. So TJ, as a senior army officer, I can tell you that you failed your defensive um, position That's exercise. Right. Perimeter, yeah, yeah. Your perimeter you was compromised. You things in your perimeter, right. Yep, so, <laughs> we, we did, we did. Of course, we were a bunch of cadets doing some advanced training, but uh, so, some of us saw that. It was like the fourth day and we were all suffering from hypothermia and everything else and sleep deprivation and, and uh, but I knew what it was. I had eyes on it because I, I don't sleep well when I'm out in the in the wild. I'm I'm on I'm pins and needles. You know, every little sound or, or, or snap twig or or whatever in the woods keeps me going. But uh, I thought it was very interesting. Very interesting. Right, right. And these things, it happens more than you think. Oh yeah. I've heard of several stories at Fort Polk where they've encountered these things. There was a story on another show where this guy claimed he was a driver at Fort Polk bringing chow out to his people in the field for when they were doing ops and uh, and was attacked by two uh, essentially, I, I'm guessing, werewolves that were were, dog, were they dogmen that were trying to get the food out of the truck. That's all they were interested in. But so they certainly a, scared the hell out of them. So that brings up a good point. That was a great story. That happened in 1981. That Very was on um, Fix Channel, and I think I downloaded that story. Um, that's might be one of the first earliest examples of Victor's guy showing up and interrogating, you know, this poor soldier and the people around him. I knew um, one of the base commanders there, and I've been trying to get in touch with him to see if he could confirm anything about that. So the one thing that he, this guy mentioned when he started asking the agents questions. Um, the head agent he, that was there, he says, well, what are these things? And uh, why don't you guys shoot him? Why don't you kill him? Well, we have plans for him. This is in right. 1981, you know, yep. so 
This That's is right. I would have been in only a year in 1981. So this was the right. same time I, I first came in. So um, That's right. Yeah, he did say that. He said we have plans for these things that they're out there and they're they're they have uh, good reasons to be out there and that we have plans for them that they're they're doing stuff for us that we need. And so that's well, you know, when they were probably just trying to get to you know, what TJ calls a super soldier program. They were experimenting with what they could use these for and then training them and how to control them. Um, so that's, I, I'm guessing uh, that's what it sounds like. I, I always tell people a story of one time when I went to a, a shop to get a haircut when I used to have hair and um, I'm reading a popular mechanics article and it was talking about the U.S. Army talking about their future super soldier program. And they were saying in their super soldier program, they want, they want super hearing. They want super sight. They want super smell. They want something that can run extreme distances without getting tired extremely fast. They, oh want, something that could, they want something that could jump 50 feet over a house. They want something that could pick up a car. They want something that could carry heavy gear. They wanted something that could find its own food in the field so you didn't have to have supply lines. Oh they wanted God. something that could communicate with comms. You know what that is? It rhymes with werewolf. Right, exactly. <laughs> so here, you know here now we see these things, and it's exactly what they said they were looking for or what they were trying to create in every single way, every manner. It's a perfection of that program. Hey, John, there's been and, a couple of people that uh, have been patiently waiting for some questions in the chat. Okay, go and ahead. What I'm going yeah, to have to do with Hollywood. Okay. And so I know you're a Hollywood expert. And um, well, I don't know about that, but I did work in Hollywood for a couple of years. So I think the question had to do with um, whether the movies um, were able to. Um, do you think the dog man and werewolves we see in the movies, being that it's so close to what people are seeing, that it might be soft disclosure? Um, I personally don't think so. I think they get it wrong every time. The things they call werewolves look like dogmen, and they don't even look like good dogmen. And if um, if Victor is correct on his assessment, he says if you want to see the closest to what the average the average dogman looks like, watch you know dog soldiers. Mm -hmm. um, now, granted, you know, he's really referring to from the waist up, not from the waist down, because they don't have dog legs. Um, if you want to see the closest thing to a werewolf, watch the 1941 Lon Chaney um, Wolfman movie. Or the new remake. Yeah. So um, if we do another show, I have pictures of, of, a, of a werewolf that I, I, can, I can post on here. that You mm -hmm. guys will be able to see if John wants them. Sure. So. Uh, and I've showed them to John and TJ, and it's just it's um it's just the head, right? So, it's actually in a British museum. Exactly. Um, yeah. You, you won't find many others that don't get stripped off the internet quickly that are the real thing. So um, these are in a these, these photos come from a British museum, and it's an actual werewolf, um, the head of one, and it's right. on display in a glass case. Mm -hmm. so, um, for those that have seen. A creature they're not sure what it is you can look at this and determine if this is close to what it was they look different from a dog man they don't have a dog head so um and then another one um oh there's another really good one here and I, you know so tj and I, i've talked about this so was it um this is the one you're referring to yeah that's the one that's the one so that's what yeah. uh that's, that's the head of a werewolf that's on display in a British museum. Yeah. And there's it from the side. Whoop. Lost it. From the side. Yep. The ears are on the side. Yeah. Mounted on the side and they go to a point. Right. Yep. yep that's and very, these very have, close to what I saw in uh, New Mexico. These things have very, very acute hearing. Um, of all the senses, that's probably the one that um, they have the strongest in. Um, hey, Lisa Miles asked, um, hey, we should find a remote viewer that can um, um, look at the LBL case and, and probably a lot of other things. And TJ and I have had this discussion about getting a remote viewer uh, or maybe a psychic as well. Um, 
somebody that's got really strong empath abilities that, um, see, that's a dog man that's um, in the museum too. And so you can see they look very different. So anyway, um, see, I wanted to, I didn't want these people just sitting out here thinking they're on rot, you know? And so thanks, Lisa. Great question. And, and TJ and I've had that discussion, by the way. Um, we, we only, we also thought that, Hey, how about if we go and look at, you know, Victor's uh, werewolf cave down in here in Virginia. Um, right. So this would be a depiction of what Victor says a werewolf is more apt to look like. Yeah, so that's the picture I would actually show Roger and see if Roger thinks that that's a good rendition. That's just a statue. That's not the real deal. Right, right. Um, no, this is it, a Hollywood. That's a Hollywood recreation for the remake of the remake of the Wolfman with uh, Vinicio del Toro um, and Anthony Hopkins and Anthony Hopkins. Right. I like that movie actually. Oh, it's a very good movie. Very good movie. Uh, um. um who else was in it? Uh, something Blunt, uh, Emily Blunt. Is that right? Yeah, that um, sounds right. Uh, but uh, and then here's the one from uh, from from Dog Soldiers. Can you see that? Okay. Yeah, yeah. That definitely looks like a dog man. Yeah, I'm gonna see if I can't get a better one. I got a couple of good ones. Yeah, I mean, some of them really say that these things look just like almost normal dogs, but just amazingly huge, you know? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, this obviously looks more canine. It's got a pronounced muzzle that's much larger. Right. Notice the ears are on top of the head as opposed to on the side of the head, yep. as TJ right. pointed out earlier. Hey, so and someone these, um, mentioned... Um, about DNA and cloning. So I know John and I have talked about this a bunch of times, and um, I'm of the opinion that um, this is just for the people that think that this is some, these creatures are something cooped up in a military lab. Um, I would, I would argue against that only because we really didn't unlock the human genome until in the last 40, 40 plus years. And that was done by an IBM supercomputer and mapping the human genome. And so to create some of these things, you would have need to have done that. And to have them um, with a range that covers the entire earth and the ability to procreate, um, for us to create something like that and then refine it and then uh, make sure we can fix it so it procreates, we couldn't have done that in just 50 years. No, there's no way. And you can talk, they'll tell you. Um, these things were, they're, they're noted in antiquity, as TJ mentioned, and, and John has mentioned as well. And of course, I've studied some of this stuff too, because I studied pre-biblical Near Eastern ancient history for the last 30 years. And some of these things have been mentioned in antiquity. The cynocephaly, a whole different creature than, than what the dog man is or what the werewolf is, or, you know, the Bigfoot. You know, if you go and, and read the Epic of Gilgamesh, you'll find that Enkidu, the hairy man of the giant hairy man of the steppe, what do you think that's describing? It rhymes with today's Bigfoot. Yeah, so um, I've seen the, the I've seen some ancient uh, descriptions of pictures of him where it actually looks more like a satyr than a than a Bigfoot. It had goat legs and hoof feet and horns, but there's different depictions in the book itself. It sounds like a hairy man yeah, um, and a wild beast. So it sounds very much like a Bigfoot. Yeah. And, and he had a wrestling match with Gilgamesh, right. You know, of which he lost, you know, Gilgamesh would have been a Nephilim, his mother Good. being a, right. a, a goddess and his father being human. Right. Um, and he was the fifth King of Uruk. So if you go and check the King list, you'll find that for Uruk, the fifth king was a character by the name of Gilgamesh. So, hence the story, the Epic of Gilgamesh is the title that um, scholars have given this, this ancient story found on clay tablets in the ancient city of Nineveh in northern Iraq. So it was, It's actually the oldest epic story in human civilization. Hmm. 
I was found in the library of Nebuchadnezzar in uh, Nineveh, uh, which is, yeah. Asher that's, Banipal. What's that? It was Asher Banipal. He was the last king of Nineveh. So okay. Nebuchadnezzar well, no, it was, no, yeah, that's correct. But when they discovered it, they discovered it in the library of Nebuchadnezzar um, in, in that time period. If I've got that right, but I don't know. I could be mixing it up. It's old. Yeah, that was the early 1800s when they uncovered this big mound in northern Iraq, and they found they it written on. They, they found it written on cuneiform on uh, ancient Sanskrit cuneiform on stone tablets, and they found thousands of them. In fact, I actually on my. <laughs> I have a recreation of one that's made from you know plastic like a, a, a Paris type thing. But this is actually one of the tablets, a recreation of one of the actual tablets, the size and how it's written. And if you can see real close, it's very hard to make out, but it's just, it looks like little squiggly lines that go in different directions, but that's called cuneiform in an ancient Sumerian language. This one tablet is a new fragment that they found that talks about, gives a, a depiction of Noah Noah's Ark and the flood that was found in the story of Gilgamesh. Yep. So, yeah, very true. Yeah. I think they even found uh, Gilgamesh's tomb. Uh, they did. Point too, didn't they? They did. They did. In fact, I do a three hour lecture on the Antichrist, in which I claim is as Gilgamesh, and which is also Nimrod. I claim they're the same person. Some scholars agree, some scholars disagree, for they argue time periods. But um, I argue in, in what I've found, and there's many others that agree with me, that Nimrod and Gilgamesh are the same person. And that would take a whole lot to go into, so I'm going to save that for another show. But they did find the body of Gilgamesh, okay? And when they found the body of Gilgamesh, it was a giant. It's Stephen Quayle, put, who I think is extremely credible, um, put out this information he said he was contacted by a U.S. Army Special Forces operative who told him he was present at the scene for the discovery of the body. He said that he was under orders to secure the body and the DNA at any cost, at absolute any cost. And he said they found a couple of bodies in this cave. There was a title um, that here lies King Gilgamesh. And uh, they said that they extracted him out. He was well preserved. And uh, in the mummification style process or through other technologies we're unaware of. But he said he was well preserved and they preserved the DNA. And they said that helicopters came in, uh, uh, cargo helicopters, so probably Chinooks, came in, picked him up and brought him to undisclosed locations. One month later, we went to war with Iraq. OK, one month after that. That's not a coincidence. And the first night of the Iraqi war. U.S. Special Forces attacked the Iraqi Museum wearing all black. They didn't break in. They were let in. And they only stole artifacts, even though there's priceless gold and possessions in this museum. They only stole artifacts from one exhibit. And that one exhibit was the personal artifacts of Nimrod. I say that's not a coincidence. Yep, yep. There's meaning and I know in everything. I know some of the guys that claim they were on the team that did the insertion for that. Yep. So. I've, heard, I've heard the same thing in, in the circles that I used to run in as well. Uh, okay. A, a lot of the stuff that is happening, John, is 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 deliberate and, right. and, and with with a purpose. With a purpose. And right. and it's it's uh, being kept from us because there again they don't think we can handle the truth. <laughs> that I, that is that's the one thing that gets me so mad is is humans sacrificing other humans if you think right. about it i mean um it, it, so this is more than just a first world or a third world problem this is mm -hmm. traitors amongst us so think about how hard it is to get to adulthood i mean you have to get through the gauntlet of whether you're going to be aborted or not um and now they even have post-birth abortions so if you make it through that, then you got to get through the pedophile rings and hope you don't get caught there, which, you know, is, is if you're paying attention to the news, more and more pedophile rings are coming down every week. Um, and as John talked about last week on last week's show, that that's the new cash crop for the cartels, because 
you can get kids across the border easier than you can cocaine. And for the elites, yeah. So um, if you get through all of that, then you have to worry about going to national parks and hoping that you don't become, you know, a snack for a cryptid that the government's going to want to cover up. Right. Uh, that is. Or, or on top of the same thing you're talking about, or you have powerful politicians that come out and say, hey, if you're a patriot, we're targeting you now with all of our intelligence agencies and military force and doing away with the Constitution to make you now the number one threat to America. Patriots. Yeah, so that's – that's. but, um, you know, back to the government. The so when you think about – the LBL is a good example. So, you know, I know that um, – I, I think I've coerced John into talking about the LBL next week, but um, – if you look at all of the police, game wardens, DNR, all the other people that know that something's going on and they're threatened into silence while other people die not knowing that they're walking into something that um, if, if they knew about it, they might not do it or they might come a little better prepared um, for how to act should you, what precautions to take you know, before you do certain things. Um, and it's, it's those government officials that are, I think are traitors to the American people. And it's not just in America, but right. in particularly, we're talking about America right now. So it's, um, if you look at Dave Pilates, over 40,000 missing people just in national parks. Yeah. Now, um, there's a theory that one that I told you I won't talk about that that include that covers this, but um, it's it's sad that s something that big is covered up by so many people that are government that that forbid you from talking about it. I right. mean, I think that is just appalling. Right. And you know that family in the LBL in 1982, they might still be living today um, if, if they weren't at the mercy of government people that didn't want to talk or warn them or prevent this from happening, you know? And there's, there's several other people who aren't alive with us today for that same purpose, yeah. same reason. I wanted to swing back to the, the Hollywood thing. When you, uh, when you, when you were answering the uh, subscribers question, as far as if you look at this, uh, you know, for example, the last show I did where I interviewed, um, the guy from the cartels down south, right? Which was a which was a great episode. Um, in in that, he was saying that he was he was amazed when he saw that there were werewolves down. For his his understanding of what he was seeing, they're actually dogmen. But he was saying he was amazed that that he saw these werewolves south of the border running next to him, and he went to his buddy who got him into that job, and he says, why in the world didn't you tell me about this? Which is a natural reaction. That's what I would have done if my buddy put me in that situation, and I was unknowing, right? Well, and then his buddy says to him, man, would you have believed me if I told you? And then again, we have another very natural reaction. I might not have believed my buddy if he told me some trash like that. If I hadn't had any prior exposure or anything like that, then my mind wouldn't be able to accept that. But then he went on to tell him that there are a lot of things in this world that, that you don't know about that are real. And that guy specifically told him vampires and werewolves are real. Yeah. All right. Now, I thought that was very interesting because uh, I've tried to do research on both of those. And it's very hard to find anything on the subject of vampires. The only stuff you do find comes back to politicians. All right. That, that seemed to live way too long for their age or something like that. But anyway, not straying too far into that, that uh, Pandora's box right now. The point of what I'm trying to say is that if you look at our culture, not just in the U.S., every major country in their culture has multiple stories and legends going back to antiquity of vampires and werewolves and other types of monsters mm -hmm. or cryptids. So if you look right now on, on Netflix, man, it's werewolf show after werewolf show after werewolf show after werewolf show. Why is this? 
Oh, and if it's not that, it's vampire show after vampire show after vampire show. I mean, there's just never, there's an endless string of werewolf vampire movies. And it's always going to be that way. It's a major genre that's always going to come back over and over again. Why is that? Why is that? It's because it's a part of our reality in one form or another and has been for uh, for a very long time. You well, know? John, John, it's 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 very interesting that you say that because I even address it in, in my book in one of the chapters that um, there is a, a very close relationship between Hollywood and the U.S. government. And oh, yeah. a lot of what's been going on over the decades is they're psychologically conditioning us yeah. to to recognize these creatures. And, and yeah. I'm actually addressing Michael SC's comment here in the comment section. He okay. he's dead on, says it is part of a soft disclosure. They're preparing us for an, ine an inevitable disclosure in the in the future because you cannot keep a secret if the secret doesn't want to stay hidden. Right, and that's right. what we're experiencing today, guys. Well, I can tell you, Hollywood's Hollywood insiders have come forward and said, hey, we've met with intelligence agencies that have fed us information, fed us scripts, or even supervised the creation of our stories to, yeah. to large degrees. Now, how deep that goes, I don't know. But uh, there's a lot of stories that have been released in film and media that have been from uh, these types of programs. One uh, one example of that that's an absolute that I've heard multiple, multiple times is uh, the movie Stargate. Mm -hmm. You know, um, uh, and so that's that's one thing. Speaking of that, uh, that viewer you just spoke of, uh, Michael SC, he had a question about why is it you hear about these things being shot with high powered rifles, yet they don't seem to take any damage. And uh, we talked about that a little bit earlier, but part of that is because they're thin. Their skin and their breastplates, especially, are so absolutely thick that it's 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 almost the same tensillary strengths as steel, and that's what you've got to understand. There's been several people that have shot these things where they said it sounds like plinking, and plinking is is to shooters when they're shooting metal targets, and it's just going bling 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 against the metal target, and they said that's what they sounded like when they they've shot these things at close distance, either with pistols or with with even high powered rifles and they don't seem to flinch even though they see like tissue damage you know well, there, there was a guy in a case that he was confronted with a a big alpha male type dog man and all he had on him was a nine millimeter and he said he could physically see the the the, the bullets mushrooming and falling and dropping to the ground and it was right. not penetrating his skin right not even so, the skin yeah so, Gary Big Boar. That's the lesson learned in that one. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, and if the skin's thick enough, and especially people don't understand, too, hair, right? Animals mm -hmm. have hair. Well, animals also have claws. That hair goes a long way to protect your skin from from, from claws and nails, you know? And muscle mass, um, too. Muscle mass. Muscle mass as well. And if you've got a solid breastplate behind there, then, yeah, it might not even damage the break the skin. You know, especially well, when the skin is thick. Victor, you know, he says headshots is what takes these creatures down if you have to take the shot. Right, so. right. But I recommend not taking the shot. Um, there was a story earlier I was going to say that y'all were talking about. There was a story where a man was sitting on his porch and he lived near the border. And he had night vision or I think it was flare equipment the, for heat signatures. And he was watching people crossing the border through his property at night. And he was just watching. And he said he saw these dogman figures closing in on this group. And apparently one of the coyotes had a rifle and shot at one of these things. And as soon as he shot at it, all the dogmen descended on him and devoured him while they let everybody else go. Mm -hmm. So my point is, unless you think you're in a life-threatening situation, do not take a shot at one of these things. Yeah, you know? I agree. So what Victor had, had, had told us numerous times um, to answer that question about how come people shoot them, you know, let's say center mass, and it doesn't seem to do any damage. Uh, just, just to piggyback what you were saying, John, is um, what Victor's words were, the dog man and the werewolf both possess a thick and durable hide that is up to five eighths of an inch thick. That's so huge. just their skin yeah. is over half inch thick. Mm-hmm. 
uh, on adults and has a large breastplate or sternum that is very thick and can only be penetrated by large caliber weapons. That's why, you know, he says do headshots, not we're all trained to do, you know, shoot center mass. Center mass. And that absolutely is not going to have the the effect that you're looking for in terms of now he he will say he shoots them there just to slow them down or to give them pause so he can get a better headshot. Right. Um, but yeah, every situation's different. And so there's a couple different um, things you could do if you can't get a headshot. And you can do what we call a mobility kill. Okay. You could probably take out their knee, their foot, something that'll that'll slow their momentum down. Softer tissue. Uh, yeah. So something that uh, you know they're they're pretty agile and quick and very fast both those creatures and if you want to slow them down you got to take out you know something that's that's going to slow them down so but i mean every situation is different and um you know you're gonna have to you're so gonna one have to of the things put on that <clears throat> one, so. one of the things victor shared with us that that blew my mind last year was um releasing releasing these creatures of course bigfoot was never part of the program but the right. werewolf and the dog man was and and when the numbers when they kept multiplying and dividing and and then they couldn't uh, accommodate the numbers at the compound anymore they had to uh you know and then the the funding you know gets cut and it's like well do we destroy these things or how about you know make sure they're well trained enough and we put chips in them so we can track them and recall them and everything else and then just release them into the wild that blew my mind when i heard that at first and then i had to to kind of socialize it a little bit and talk about it and it's like okay well i understand the purpose in doing all of that but there again we're having these cases more so now because the longer these things are in the wild the more wild they become they, they, I think they tend to forget their training, you know, and everything is more focused on survival. Well, once, once they're away from it, think about this. When you're in boot camp, all right, you, you're, you're trained to accept orders to an absolute T and not question them, all right? And when you, when you get out of boot camp, it's sir, yes, sir, and, and that's it, you know? You're going to follow any order your commander gives you, period. Now, Years down the road from that, when you're separated from that and you're in other environments with other peers, then you tend to have more of a, well, I'm not going to follow that order, you know, or, you know, I'm going to second guess it or I'm going to do my own thing. So, yeah, once they get out of the program and they get into an environment with their own peers, you know, it, it's certainly going to be a thing where it's, hey, we can even develop an attitude now of why do we have to obey these what these humans are telling us and we do our own thing, you know, we're the, we're the alpha species, you know what I'm saying? So, uh, apparently they're not free from ego either. You know, <laughs> they have that same curse that we do. TJ, one of the, one of the things I wanted to ask you is with your experience in the, in the middle East or, or you too, Hunter, um, did, did y'all come across cryptid stories in the middle East while you were there? And, uh, one thing I heard a story one time about a special access unit, supposedly some SF guy claimed that he said that um, under the Euphrates River, there was a prison in Iraq. And he said the people there were scared to death because there was all this paranormal activity stuff going on. And he said he found a hallway underneath that prison. And he said he opens this, this large door down this hallway. And he says, sure enough, he finds this giant, for lack of a better word, angel that was chained with these giant chains to the floor. And he said this thing was a giant and it had huge wings, giant wings. And he said, he said the thing spoke to him and said, what are you doing here? It's not yet my time. And the wow. guy was like, this scared the crap out of me. The guy yeah. claims to be a professed Christian and said he worked in a unit that dealt with cryptids. That, that dealt with that kind of stuff. So that, that was the craziest thing I've, I've heard out of, out of there. And, and I've heard of several other uh, cryptid encounters. We've, we've talked about the giant of Kandahar. Most people in the audience should be familiar with that. Again, from Steve Quayle and L.A. Marzulli, which did a fantastic work on that. I think is very credible. Uh, and you can go to those sources to look that information up. Um, but also people talk about dogman encounters in Iraq and other cryptids and some say the reason we dropped the big the big boy the big bomb out there 
um, was was because we were pushing things back in cave systems that were coming up. So you two gentlemen have worked in the sandbox. So uh, do you have any experience or even heard rumors of such things when you were out there? Well, Hunter, uh, let, let me go first because I yeah, go I did not experience anything or see anything peculiar there, but I did hear fellow team members from other teams saying, uh, oh, by the way, you don't want to go over to that sector. Uh, there's some crazy stuff going on over there. You know, stay away from it. Don't go in there unless you absolutely have to or you're directed to. So, you know, and I, I wasn't. So thank goodness I didn't experience the, the crazy <laughs> stuff. But I, okay. I suspected that there's a lot going on all over the world that uh, would totally I, blow our minds if, if the truth was I, made known. I heard of an infantry team that found the cave system under a village. And they went to explore the cave system, and they got cut off from other other members of their of their party. And when they caught up to them, they said that there were these these giant, tall humanoid creatures with bat wings that had the wings surrounded by their their infantry team. And they said that they were like digesting them through the bat wings. And they were like, "Oh hell no!" And turned around, got out of there, and blew the site. Yeah, yeah. And that, by the way, that's straight out of a movie, um, the the Beastmaster <laughs> from like 1980. You know, yeah, sounds like a nightmare. Yeah, you know, that's a nightmare. It was a nightmare hearing about it. I can imagine seeing that. I'd be scarred for life. Yeah, I, I haven't. You know, so I spent six years over there, and yeah, you know, I would hear little things, but nothing that you know I could tell you a story about. Um, and most of those things came from Iraq. Um, and even though I spent three years in Afghanistan, you know, you would hear uh, most people wouldn't talk about um, the things they encountered if they were out, you know, because we are, were, they were doing foot patrols at 8,000 feet above sea level. And they would go out, they'd be outside the wire. Um, and they were measuring things down to ounces, what they would carry. Hmm. And so they'd be outside the wire for a good, a good amount of time. And um, they didn't come back with, well, they didn't share any unusual stories. Although, you know, I heard, um, you know, people had, had mentioned seeing something like a Bigfoot once. And I think I heard someone mention seeing like a dog man once. Nothing I can story um, while I was there. Now, um, in Iraq, um, you would have, you would occasionally hear, you know, the locals talk about really weird stuff like um, a chimera or something that, that I think that's what you would refer it to. Um, right. Now, my, my most fun I had in Iraq um, was I got, to, I got to visit the ancient igarat in, in Ur. I got to climb on top of it, actually. Yeah, okay. That's and been I, in the news I, lately, yeah. I knew more about that place than the tour guide, um, mm. you know, so that was, and the same thing when I went and spent the night in the ancient city of Babylon. So mm. Babylon was one of our bases. Right. And so I got to, you know, tour that and I knew more about the place than the lady giving the tour. And so you could go and you could see the ancient wall and you see some ancient bricks and then you see newer bricks on top of them. Like the wall was being rebuilt and this, this, first brick and the old part, uh, the lower part would say, this wall was built by King Nebuchadnezzar. And you go a few rows up and you say, this wall was built by Saddam Hussein, you know, cause he was, he wanted to bring Babylon back to its ancient glory as it were. Um, so, um, you know, so the same kind of feelings you get sometimes you're in the woods and everything goes quiet and you get the, you're in the, you know, the dead zone. Right. I would get sometimes that kind of feeling just sitting there absorbing everything that had happened 4,000 years ago in that area. Cause my mind would go there like who, who was standing here 4,000 years ago. Here I am in the throne room. That's where um, Alexander the great died in around 335 or so BC um, of malaria, I guess is what they're estimating it was today. And you have an ancient procession road. Um, you know, this was King Nebuchadnezzar's city, was Babylon. Um, so there's uh, the 
Tower of Babylon was not within the grounds of the base, you know, but the ancient city itself was. So that was kind of cool. I got to take it to Nineveh. Um, one, that was that ancient city was outside the wire, so it required a deliberate convoy to get out there to it. And so usually that was kind of a risky thing, and we didn't have a real bona fide operational need to go out and visit that since I was right in uh, Baghdad for a year, and then I was I spent a year in Camp Anaconda, which is up in Balad. That's a, about you know, an hour of Baghdad. So yeah, I know sexy stories to talk about Christmas <laughs> from from my my time over there. Unfortunately, uh, Wait, hey, other John, cool stuff maybe, about that. Yeah, John, maybe you could uh, help me out here. What, what are we in the fifth or sixth extinction of man? Do you remember? Go. Oh, I, I have I have no idea other than we're coming up to one right now. Yeah, I- exactly. And and in my research, and I'm I just happened to to see Sherry Clark's uh, comment about the veil is thinning. And, and I absolutely believe that, that, that the longer that our generation of man continues to exist, the more we discover every year about our ancient past. Right. The, the, the more encounters we have th- with these creatures, the more people come forward and share information. I mean, and we're, we're seeing a, a total, a total uh, coming forward of people uh, doing deathbed confessions and insider, you know, uh, stories and reports and 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 whistleblowers and all of this. People are coming forward because they're not happy with the direction everything is going today with all the secrecy and and, and you know we're being denied so much. The 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 normal people are our, our handlers are the ones that are cutting deals without letting us in on the deal. Right. Um, so, but I think the longer that we continue to exist, yes, the thinner this veil is going to get to the point to where there is no other alternative than to disclose the truth and what has been going on in the world with 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 mankind and everything in it. Right. Right. Definitely. Yeah. I, I heard a bunch of crazy stories in Iraq um, when I did a show with uh, um with with Jody Cook, he said that soldiers told him that they saw, they witnessed the only thing they could describe is Anubis. And they said it was like 14 feet tall. It was wearing the full like uh, Egyptian style clothing. But they said that the soldiers got scared and started shooting it. And they said that it looked at them like, like they were, that it was nothing and just walked into a, a mist and disappeared. And said, but he said, as he swears, they said that. That they gave him that story. And then also, um, I have a personal friend of mine um, who who spent some time with a general in um, in Iraq. And he said that the general told him that he came across a bunch of black eyed uh, people that he said he, he just believed were like demon possessed or something. But their eyes were completely black from from side to side. I mean, all you can see is blackness, which doctors say that you would be blind if, if your eyes were, were like that. But he said that they encountered these all the time in Iraq. He says he just shot them whenever he came across them. But the same general, this guy told me, said that uh, he was sitting in a helicopter being transported one day and he's in the back. And he said he heard a voice say, I am the Prince of Persia and I'm going to open this door on the skid. And I want you to jump out. And the general said, told my friend, the next thing he realized, the door was open and he's standing in the doorway, like getting ready to jump. And he said it took like a lot of mental strength to pull himself back from that and and resist that. You know, so it was a, it was just a crazy, scary, unexplainable type encounter. Um, I've heard soldiers talk about that they had uh, infrared footage, uh, from helicopters, um, that, that they saw dog men attacking people. Um, um, there's, I've had a source that told me they dropped the dog man into an Iraqi camp just to see what would happen. And it, and it decimated everybody, you know, why onlookers are sitting back. Um, Sancho, the guy I interviewed last week said that when he was dealing with the villagers in some of the cities in Afghanistan, he said that the villagers were putting out 
goats as sacrificial offerings uh, when they would take all the rest of the goats and put them in their homes and their houses and sleep with them. And he says, why are you sticking some out here and putting the rest in your homes? And they said, because there's giants in the mountains and they come down and take those. As long as we leave something for them, they don't come and bother us or the rest of our herds that we depend on for our livelihood. And he, he said, I thought that was all crap. I thought this little kid's making this sto these stories up until he came home and found out that there's a whole lot more to reality than he or, or initially understood. And now he's like, oh, my gosh, now, now that makes sense. What's going on with that? You know what I mean? So. So we're coming close to uh, well, we're two hours. So we're coming close to the end. One one last thing point I wanted to to, to reiterate, which was the purpose of this show. And that is is basically in the conclusion of talking about Victor as being a, a credible source. And for the naysayers, again, I'm going to point out, for somebody who comes on the scene and claims what Victor claims, and somebody that puts out original content on the level uh, that, that Victor has put out, this person deserves to be vetted. And vetted by people who are in a position to make a determination. Because as Hunter pointed out, there are no absolutes in this game, in this business. There's no absolutes. And but what we can do is try to examine and analyze the information that we have and use that to come to, uh, to probable solutions. So whether something is more credible or less credible. And I can't officially confirm that Victor is absolutely on the level and real. What I can say is, based off of the evidence that's been presented, based off of the fact that he's given, he's not only known about stories that were brought up to him, but he gave more information that he shouldn't have known and, and, and had access to and confirmed these stories. And then, and then also when he's given uh, credible information or when he's given information on differences between dogmen and werewolves, that you actually have people that are describing seeing both separate types in the in the field or in the bush or in the in the world. Mm -hmm. So I think it this goes a long way to add towards the credibility of what Victor's saying. So in the end of all this, um, some people thought John. They're saying John, why are you bashing Victor? I'm not bashing Victor. In fact, the reason I'm doing this show is because I'm tired of hearing other people bash Victor and Jeff. And what I'm trying to do is support Jeff and Victor to say, I don't care, you know, what, I mean, it's great. Everyone has the right to their opinion. And I'm not, I'm, and I'm not trying to say I'm absolutely correct either uh, over anyone else. But I'm listening to the opinion of people who have done actual homework research to come to their conclusions and not someone who just off the bat says, oh, that sounds absurd. He's false. You see what I'm saying? So that's mm -hmm. where I'm coming from. All right. So I think Victor's contribution thus far, uh, ever since he came onto the scene last year, uh, ha has been amazing because it, it it helped me draw conclusions and fill in blanks and and, and complete a much bigger picture uh, that, that I was trying to put together for myself. Uh, and no, guys like uh, Hunter also out there, you're doing your own investigation from a different angle. And you know what? The truth, the truth to all of this lies in the public domain. And we're not getting much help from the government whatsoever. So, so our truth lies in the public domain. And what each and every one of us has to share with each other is, is what's going to help paint the picture that we can actually believe in and know as come to know as the actual truth. You know, even short of a full disclosure, we know these things exist. Too many people are coming in contact with them and experiencing even much, much more than just the big three. So, so we know that this veil, the longer we continue to exist, the more we experience this, the more we share with each other, the more encounters we have, the, the, the thinner the veil is going to get to the point to where they can no longer keep this truth hidden from us any longer. And, and it'll be a wonderful <laughs> thing when it happens. Yeah, so I um, I haven't done anything unusual. It, uh, I just did um, and continue to do a very thorough investigation and research on on the things that um, you know I need to satisfy my own 
um, I guess, ethics when it comes to those things. Um, and not to mention, uh, I don't necessarily want to endorse something that I, I can't, I can't defend. So, um, you know, for me, Victor has, um, he's finished some stories that he shouldn't have had access to. And he's provided intimate details about these cryptids and his operations and how they track them. Um, things he has, you know, lifted the veil on a lot of things that many people have had suspicions about, but has never been proven or even had someone uh, from the inside that could reveal these kinds of details. And so everyone's, every serious researcher should have gotten um, a boost in their knowledge, you know, from this. But, you know, everyone has to go and do their own due diligence. Um, you got, you know, drive-by researchers that expect all the evidence to be presented to them. Well, no, screw you. Don't be, don't be a lazy researcher. Go out and do your work. Right. Don't just you know? take our, our opinions for it. Right. And I've given you guys the answers to the test on a few things. I gave you dates and places to go to verify some of the information that, that I use. Now, granted, it's more meaningful to me because I was the one that presented some of it. And the answers I got back, you know, I was like shocked because like, how does he know that? So he's not some drunken, you know, truck driver from Georgia, you know, that's, that's, you know, playing cryptid hunter on the weekend. So he's, he's definitely knows some things that um, many other people that have been doing this for a long time aren't privy to. So anyway, so that's, um, I'm glad we had the discussion, John. Thanks for having you know, TJ and I on. Yeah, um, absolutely. Absolutely. And I, I want to, to anyone that hasn't heard of Jeff's show, uh, uh, Jeff Nadalny at uh, Dogman Encounters, please go into his show and check out. He's got a great show and listen to his stories on Victor. He's done a fantastic job with helping getting this information out to the public, which we wouldn't have or be discussing if it wasn't for Jeff and his work. So I would okay. definitely like to appreciate Jeff and thank him for that and encourage people to check out his show and, and listen to Victor's stories. But yeah, um, I believe definitely that, that I cannot verify 100% if Victor is true and on the level, but I believe that absolutely it's more credible than it is that he's not credible at this point. And, and you know, what uh, I'm going to suggest people is uh, with anything yeah, believe until it's time not to believe. Right. You know, so. Be open-minded. Um, hey, so what did you have planned for next week? So um, next week we're, we're working on doing a similar show just like this one, which will be kind of a panel discussion that will be specifically discussing the uh, LBL case and the different theories from different parties. Uh, and also in light of the new uh, supposed eyewitness, Roger. And we'll talk about whether that story sounds credible or not, whether we all of a sudden, after all these years from 1982 to now, now we suddenly have a new witness that's popped up on the scene who's going around making, uh, going around the network, you know, doing different shows. We just did one with Josh Turner. And, um, and so we'll talk about that and the information he's putting out and how that collaborates and fits in what other researchers have done. But it's such a hot topic. Uh, and one that people really seem to enjoy that uh, in light of the new information with Roger, I think it's worth, uh, I think it's worth investigating, talking about other shows are doing it. So why not? You know, it's the, hey, it's the hot I, topic at the moment. Hey, and if John's cool with it, um, I got a lot of material on this particular topic and I'm willing to post it up in the uh, community section. So you guys can follow along if you like. So hopefully you have um, a PDF reader. I'll probably make sure everything's in PDF. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that more later. Right now, our systems are, like, iffy on stuff. So, But, uh, but yeah, we'll, we'll work on that. I know uh, you're wanting to, to get something together, especially for researchers. So that's, that's great. But anyway, um, uh, I've got to get going. But I want to thank the guest, Hunter, TJ. Thank you. I appreciate uh, – first of all, I appreciate your service. I appreciate to this country and being patriots. And your background, your knowledge, the work and effort that you've done into your investigations, your the books that you're both working on, 
Um, and um, I'm glad to promote the, these books and get this information out there for people. So I want to thank you again. I thank you for the audience. I hope the audience appreciated uh, the show tonight. If you liked it, please hit the, the thumbs up button and uh, subscribe and tell your friends about the show. If you have your own encounters and want to get them on there and, and suss it out like we do, then please go to support at dogmancans.com and, and send your story and, uh, and we'll get it out there. So thank you, everybody. Take care. Have a blessed weekend and a good night.